That's a grand fish, Sandy. Uh, that's a nice what about fish. a drum? I don't mind if I hear a drum, eh? He'll stay the next in, then. Yes, Scotch whisky is the true product of Scotland, and it cannot be made anywhere else. If your step should take you into the Speyside district of the Highlands, you will come across distillery after distillery in which the first stages of turning barley into whisky are performed. It's a fascinating story, so let's begin at the beginning. After harvesting, the barley comes to the distillery from the local farmer. In this shot, there seems plenty of it, but there have been years in which barley has been scarce, and the effects of such scarcity are felt long, long afterwards. The barley is now steeped in water for about 60 hours. The action of water and of heat cause it to germinate, which is the outward and visible sign of the changing of starch into sugar inside the ear of barley. While the sprouting barley lies on the malting floor, it's constantly turned by men with wooden shovels. If you pick up a handful of barley from the loft before it's steeped, it looks like this under the magnifying glass. After being steeped in water, you can plainly see the germination or sprouting. The growth of the barley has to be stopped before it goes too far. So it's dried in a kiln. The kiln is easy to pick out in a distillery from the pagoda-like top, similar to the oast house in a hop garden. The furnace below the kiln is served with coke and peat. The aroma of the peat imparted to the barley during this drying stage eventually gives character to the whiskey. Peat is the natural fuel of the highlands and you can't make the true Scotch malts without it. Cutting it is a man's job. They are setting it up for drying before stacking. Up in the kiln itself, men are turning over the drying malt amidst the aroma of the peat. The peat reek, as it's called. The floor being perforated allows the heat to rise through it. The next stage takes the malt to an enclosed mill in which it's crushed before passing into what is known as the mash tun. It pours in, looking rather like porridge, for water heated to 146 degrees Fahrenheit has been added. Rotating arms keep the mixture swirling. At the end of an hour or so, the sugar has been dissolved into a liquid which is now known as Wurtz. The draft, or solid remnant of the ground barley, remains in the mash tun and is removed from it by a conveyor. This draft is valuable for feeding cattle. About 26% of the barley employed is recovered for this highly important purpose. The valuable sugary solution of the barley, the Wurtz, passes through a cooling process and in due course goes to the next stage, that of fermentation. In this large tun room, not to be confused with the mash tun, are eight vessels, some of them full, some of them awaiting their turn. In the empty vessel the man is dwarfed and if left over long he may join the spirits. The Duke of Clarence died that way in a butt, but he chose Malmsey wine. The full vessels contain the worts and an important addition, yeast. Look in the encyclopedia for a technical description of yeast. For our practical purposes, it's enough to state this, that yeast, part animal, part vegetable, is the agent of fermentation. It turns sugar into alcohol. And its methods are somewhat violent. The liquid bubbles up, a 
head is created, which has to be controlled by a switcher or rotating arm, so that it won't overflow. Now, the crux of the operations, distilling. And by this time, the state, through its agent, the Customs and Excise, is taking a very full interest in proceedings. Distilling, of course, means the heating of liquid till it becomes vapour, then cooling it till it becomes liquid again. During the process, a separation of water from spirit takes place, which makes the last stage distinctly more powerful than the first. In the shape of the stills, resembling a giant pot, may reside the secret virtue of Scotch whisky. By the bobbin. Well, the sound of its tap on the casing indicates to the still man that the wash, or fermented wort, is not rising too high and choking the neck of the still. Outside the building stand the worm cooling tubs, where the neck of the still is carried down in a spiral coil through cold water. This makes the vapour liquid again. Back inside the still house again to observe that whisky is distilled twice. And here it's passing through the spirit safe. A safe means a lock, and the revenue keeps the key to this one. But the distiller can do his testing and selecting without touching the spirit. On the left, the distillation of the first still, which is going to be distilled again. In the centre, the fully distilled whisky. This is it, real whisky. On the right, the gauges for testing the strength. Hundreds of casks lying beside the distillery, waiting to be filled. For, as everybody knows, Scotch whisky has to mature, and the maturing takes place over a period of years. It's carefully selected and well coopered casks. The cooper, to be sure, is a very important member of the distillery staff. The casks are filled in a special building, sometimes known as the spirit store, but here called a duty-free warehouse. The door is fastened by two locks, one controlled by the excise department, the other by the distillery management. From the spirit vat, which stands at the rear of the store, the casks are filled with the new whiskey. Samples are taken from each cask. Strength is checked, and the amount of proof spirit is calculated by customs officer and distillery manager. Then the quantities in each butt and hogshead are called out, with the excise officer checking the figures to make sure that all weights, identities and other particulars are correct. And presently, the casks are rolled down to the storage warehouses. Here's the place for the connoisseur, the warehouse. Hundreds of casks stacked and mellowing. As for connoisseurs, every distilleryman is a connoisseur in the sense of being an expert. A drop of good stuff. A tap on the cask tells the expert ear whether it's still sound or not. Oh, liquor. There seems to be plenty of whiskey here, but the trouble is you can't drink your whiskey and keep it and owing to the restriction on the production over the war years, a rationing had to be voluntarily imposed by the distillers. Some whiskies go back to 1927, but the average age of whisky used in blends is about eight to 10 years old. Outside a large blending and bottling plant, for we've taken a big leap from the glens to the blending centers. And please imagine, as we open up the doors with the customary routine, 
but a period of years has elapsed since you saw the stuff being distilled earlier in the picture. Casks containing the matured whiskey are being rolled onto the blending floor for the beginning of the final process, which will convert the contents into the familiar bottled scotch. Products of many different distilleries contribute to the final blend. The bungs are withdrawn and samples are taken to satisfy the blender that the whisky is up to standard and uncontaminated by any foreign matter. Watch the methods of the experienced old blender who carries out the tests in his sample room. I am examining these samples prior to blending to satisfy myself they are fully matured. These are the Highland malt whiskies from our various distilleries. These are the Isle of Mork whiskies from the island of Isla. And these are the green whiskies. Believe it or not, it's nose as does it. Now the unlocking of pump valves under supervision of an excise officer. There are two series of blending vats fed by stout pipes. Into troughs serving these pipeways, the whiskey from the selected casks is emptied. The blending vats, into which the whisky is poured, stand in their own warehouse and may contain many thousands of gallons. Only the tops of the vats can be shown. Blending, incidentally, is a specialised process identified with each blender. The various whiskies from different distilleries settle down and blend themselves amiably in the vats. And, of course, as at every stage in whisky production, samples are taken to ensure the highest quality. And now the valves are unlocked below the main blending vat for the liquid to flow out and down the outlet pipes. For once again, the blended whisky has to be filled into casks to go through the marrying process. However, this is the last our whisky will see of wood, for blending is complete and it's ready for bottling. Bungs are withdrawn and the contents of each cask are measured by the excise officer. Then the whisky is poured into the troughs again. It's then carried to bottling vats, which stand at the back of the large room where bottling's in progress. Every other operation in whisky production has been slow and gradual to achieve that smooth perfection, which is the hallmark of Scotch whisky. Bottling, by contrast, is a rapid process. Capping is another mechanical operation, self-explanatory too. But. Note the special care with which each bottle is examined and re-examined under powerful inspection lights. More machinery attaches the labels under supervision. The trademark on these labels is absent, for the Scotch Whisky Association present this film as the story of whisky production, not as advertisement for any particular blend. Bottled, wrapped and packed into cases, the final article, as perfect as care and consistency at every stage can make it, is ready for the consumer. Now it's on its way to the Scottish Inn and big towns, to the docks, countries overseas, to the ends of the earth. 
but it all starts up in the Scottish Highlands, up in the clear air of the peat-covered moors, where the waters of some crystal stream tumble quietly over its ancient rocks, and the hereditary skill of the Scottish distillerman is applied with conscientious efficiency to his superb craft. Oh! 